What's up guys and gals, welcome back to the Nerd Castle for the next episode of our weekend review, although I'm thinking about changing the name around and making it something like a little bit more engaging, a little bit more like eye-catching, but my name is Splattercat, I'm happy to have you here today as we talk about the normal things that we do on Sundays. Now first and foremost, I am trying to adapt this series and make it a little bit more accessible, I've been poring over the numbers for previous weekend reviews, and while there is a dedicated audience that watches these videos, I think that I need to spruce them up a little bit. I need to like kind of get that old car smell out and make it smell a little bit more piney in here. Maybe have a little bit more point, make it smaller, make it more poignant, and make it more topical. So for example, we're still going to have the Q&A section. I will still on occasion talk about games that we're currently playing on the Nerdcastle. However, I'd like to pick a topic each week and just sort of talk about it. I talked about this, I guess, about two weeks ago, but then we had the 100,000 video and so nothing really happened. And the first topic that I'm going to start off with is actually kind of like a sad one. This is this is not like a fun thing to talk about, but I'm supposing it needs to be addressed. Um, and the reason being is that there's been a lot of it, there's been a lot of evidence like heaped at my feet as like a YouTube caster and like a Twitch personality that this is a larger issue than I assumed that it was. And so we're going to talk about child abuse today because honestly, like every single month, I have a few emails from kids that are like, yeah, my parents beat on me all the time, like, my parents are very, very abusive, and I'm not going to name names, I don't want this to be a public spectacle, I just want it to be known that I receive emails like this on a regular basis, like, this is not, like, a weird thing, like, for me, I've gotten this now on a couple different occasions over the course of the last month and a half, to the extent that I feel like I need to address it, and we can just, like, talk about it, and, you know, discuss, I think maybe some people don't know how to get help for something like this, or what their options are. I can only really talk about what you should be doing in the United States. Un unfortunately, I don't really know what social services and things like that are available overseas or in other countries like, for example, in Australia or what services are available in Sweden or, you know, the Czech Republic or whatever. I can't speak to that because I just I don't have that experience. But first and foremost, what I want to talk about every month, I get a couple of these emails and they follow not a similar tone, but they vary in severity. I've heard everything from parents beating their children with, like, weapons, like clubs, like table legs and stuff like that to just things that put tears in your eyes. Like, honestly, I was reading an email the other night, and I am not, like, a soft-hearted individual. I'm not the sort of person. I'm very stoic when it comes to emotions. But I read an email the other night, and I just had tears in my eyes. Like, I didn't even know, like, how to address this. Like, because this child, essentially, this individual was in their teens, and this individual was talking about the fact that on a weekly basis, they are abused by their parents. Like, not like they caught a whipping. Like, because in my family, it wasn't uncommon to get, like, you got caught with a spoon, or mom would, like, grab your ear when you got in trouble or whatever. These are normal, like, old-school punitive type things. I'm talking about, like, hands-on, just, like, abuse for no reason other than the fact that, like, the parent is angry or frustrated or drunk. And in this email, this individual really felt like they were backed into a corner. Like, they said they had no idea how to deal with this. And unfortunately, because they were from somewhere that was not the United States, I wasn't sure how to help this person. And this is probably the third or fourth since New Year's that I've gotten from various children, younger viewers talking about the fact that their home life is not good and they're being abused on a regular basis. And so first and foremost, I'm going to start out by saying as adults, we have a responsibility if we know that these things are happening to help these children. Like you can't, I understand it's, it's somewhat of a scary situation to be in having to decide whether you want to interject on someone else's family business. But at the point where your family business or someone else's, I, that sounded a little bit threatening, but anyways, at the point it becomes somebody's family business to beat on a child, I feel like it's essentially in the better good of public interest. It's time for neighbors and family members and bystanders to step in and make authorities aware of situations like this. And so if you know that a child is being hurt or a child is being abused or one of your children's friends comes to school with black eyes and they have no explanation or anything like that, this is something that like needs to be discussed. Don't let it go under the rug because it's only going to get worse. And so I'm going to start off by telling a story right now for anybody out in the audience. If you're a younger viewer and you're being abused right now and you are having trouble with your parents laying hands on you, bruising you, blacking your eyes, breaking your ribs, hurting you, whatever it is. This is where I'm going to start out. This is a weird subject for me to talk about because, honestly, I don't know if it's right for me to talk about things that I don't fully understand. But from my perspective, I'm going to start by giving you an antidote from when I was a kid. When I was in high school, 
there was a kid that I knew, a kid that I grew up with. In fact, I knew him probably about since first grade to second grade on. And I knew him all the way until the time that we graduated. And this individual had parents that did abuse him flat out. And so fast forward 20 years, this individual now is a producer for a record company. He's making lots of money. He's very well adjusted. He's a kind hearted individual that does all kinds of charity work, good things for the world. Like all in all, Given the things that he suffered through, you would have expected him to turn out a lot worse, but that's not the point of the story for right now anyways. We'll come back to it. In high school, I knew him, and occasionally he'd come to school with a bruised up jaw, or he'd come to school with like a blacked out eye, or he'd come to school with bruises on his ribs or something when we were in the gym, you know, when you change clothes to go to gym. He would have like bruises, like black and blue. It looked like somebody took a whoop into him real bad. And nobody thought about it, you know, like, because we were boys and a lot of us were on the football team. A lot of us were on varying, like, sports and things like that. Like, I came to school with bruises and stuff like that, like, on my neck from playing, like, full contact sports and stuff like that. And so I think everybody just assumed that, like, outside of school, he was doing extracurricular activities. I mean, young kids, honestly, when you're 14 years old, like, how observant were you? Because, honestly, I was so self-absorbed with, like, random things when I was 14, like, being cool and, like, knowing slang and stuff like that that I frankly wasn't observing anybody else's problems whatsoever. But it turns out, I found out years later, that his dad was abusing him. His dad used to lay hands on him almost on a daily basis. And after I became aware of that, somewhere around, I guess, my sophomore year in high school, whenever I think about this individual, there's one image that I see in my head. And I talked to him a while back, and he said, yeah, the thing about that time period is that it felt very hopeless. Like he said, I can't express that enough. Like, It's a weird thing to know that you're going home to a place where you're not safe, that you're going home to a place where it's going to get worse. For a lot of kids, going to school is a threatening experience because there's fights, there's bullies, there's whatever, there's tests, there's lots of scary things going on when you go to junior high or high school or whatever it is, but when you go home, you're supposed to feel safe. And his big point was that like school was safer than home for him. When he got home, he wasn't quite sure when his dad was going to get on the sauce and just start tuning him up because he was in a bad mood. And so the image that I remember, like this person, I'm not using names. Once again, I would never, this is sort of like strictly in confidence type stuff, I guess. And so I want this to remain as anonymous as possible. And in fact, from what I've given you right now, I don't think the person would be able to identify it. But honestly, the thing I remember about this person is one day he got picked up by his dad. And this is after I had become aware of like the fact that somebody else had mentioned it to me, I think, at one point where I was like, oh, yeah, dude, his dad kicks the shit out of him all the time because I hadn't known until somebody said that to me. And I saw him driving away and he was looking out the window and he had a black eye and he just sort of like turned and looked back at the school like he wanted to go back almost like he just he wanted to go back to school. He did not want to go home. That was the definite look in his eye. And that's the image that I hold of this person for the rest of my life. Like, I have him on my Facebook. He's a friend of mine. I've talked to him. He's more of an acquaintance now than anything because, honestly, people head all over the U.S. and all over the world after they finish high school and college. But for all the happy pictures that are up on his Facebook page and, like, all of his other various social medias, Twitter, that's the image that I remember in my head of him is him looking back over his shoulder with a black eye at the school like he wanted to go back. And he expressed to me one time when we had a conversation that, It's so dark to be in that situation because nobody helps you because nobody wants to like get involved in business that is not theirs because this is a situation that could potentially become very, very ugly, very explosive, very nasty. It could become essentially like a giant family matter between two families that are now essentially like Hatfields and McCoys because you don't know. That's a very serious accusation to make. And so much like with any sort of abuse, I think people balk at maybe addressing it or reporting it to the proper authorities because it's very, very difficult to retain your anonymity in that situation. Eventually, somebody's going to have to come forward and testify with what they've seen, and you're signing up for a lot of just, like, conflict if you're wrong. You've basically ruined a relationship forever. You've created an enemy for life if you mess this accusation up. And so most people, I think, want to be very, very sure. But with abusive situations like this, it's not always going to be worn on somebody's sleeve and something that you can just be like, aha, and point it out. And so he said that in that situation, what always surprised him as a 15-year-old is that nobody helped him. Not one person said anything. Not his friends. Not the teachers at school. They saw him come to school with the bruises and stuff like that. But nobody wanted to step across the line and finally be like, is your home life okay? Like, what's going on here? He said that a couple teachers alluded to it, but he was worried about the fact that if he essentially, like, snitched on his dad, that it was going to get worse at home. 
And so what he said in that situation was that he was in such a dark place as a teenager that he thought about ending his own life because he felt like that was the only way to escape from that situation. As a 15, 16 year old, home is supposed to be your refuge. It's supposed to be the place that above all else, you should be protected from the things outside. And when you take that from a child as a very, very damaging thing to do to their psyche, especially at a point where hormones and everything else are going crazy, they're just now starting to learn about the world and like soak things in and think for themselves and come up with their ideas. It's a very, very damaging thing. And he admitted that in a point of weakness, he thought about it all the time, just ending his life. And he said, and this is my point, if you are in that dark place right now, if you are in a situation where you're being abused or anything like that and nobody is helping you, I want you to hear at least this message from me. And that's that it will get better. This individual nowadays is a wonderful human being. He's wealthy. He has a lovely family. He does charity. He gives back to the community a lot. Considering the things he went through, you would have expected him to turn out to be a nasty, horrible human being because that's how some people deal with that stimuli. They become very, very insular i guess they get a very hard outer shell and they turn into sort of like a you know forget the world type mentality where it's just like me versus everybody then this individual did not respond with that well he has a lovely life now things are in front of him that have all come together but he said to me one time that had he known when he was 15 what he knows now how his life would have turned out he wishes he could have gone back and told himself it's gonna be okay this period of your life is not going to last forever even if nobody helps you it's not going to last forever. There's no need for drastic action. Someday, you'll be out of this place. You'll be safe. Everything will be fine. You're going to have your own family. You'll have your friends, and you'll never have to go back there again. And he said, I wish I could tell my younger self that so that I would have never had to suffer those dark thoughts in the first place. And so my point here is that if nobody decides to come forward and help you, if you're being abused right now, or if you're at a point in your life where somebody's laying hands on you in an inappropriate way, don't punish yourself for the sins that they are committing. It will get better when you get older, and I can only hope that somebody comes forward and tries to help you. Now, at this point, this is where I address the adults and also the, you know, the kids, the teenagers, everybody in my audience right now, young adults, essentially. If you know that this is taking place, we have a responsibility as members of society to take a chance on this, and I'm not saying to throw accusations around wildly, but just ask the kid where they got that bruise or, you know, just kind of be like, hey, what happened to your eye right there, man? And just kind of like watch their reaction. If they become very defensive about it, if they become very shaky about it. If the story they tell obviously doesn't seem to jive, like you need to bring this up either to their school, to their teachers, to a social worker, like something like somebody needs to do something about this because the long term effects of a child being abused in this fashion, it's simply not acceptable. And as adult members of society, and even as young adult members of society who may not be 18 yet, there are still ways you can affect this situation. You can talk to a teacher, you can talk to a social worker at your school, you can talk to a principal, and I know there's a lot of things in the world right now that are like, oh, don't snitch, don't talk to authorities, things like that, but stuff like this needs to be talked about. This does not fall underneath the umbrella of don't snitch. This is the sort of thing where somebody needs to be rescued from this situation. It needs to be dealt with. And judging from the emails that I get on a fairly regular basis, I figured that I would touch on it here at the beginning of this video and just sort of talk about something that I think is a very, very dark subject and just sort of lend my heart because it's rare. I, I read that email, the last one that I got especially. I got this email and just seriously, I had a lump in my throat. I had tears in my eyes because I felt so desperate. Like I needed to help this individual, but they're all the way across the world. What do I do? I've never felt so helpless in my entire life. And so I thought, you know what, the only way for me to affect this is to make a video about it and just talk about things that we can do as the bystanders of these situations to maybe remedy the situation. It's a horrible, horrible thing to think about. And I sincerely hope that the numbers of people suffering from this are lower than I think they are. But judging from the emails I get, I just don't know. And so if you're not an adult, you can talk to somebody at your school. You can ask questions from your friend. You don't even need to talk to a teacher. You can talk to your friend and just be like, hey, man, what's going on? Because maybe you may not be able to make a social worker or something aware of it, but maybe as their friend, you can become aware of their situation and be a support strut for them if they don't want it reported or if they're not ready to do anything about it. Or, you know, it's, it's a very, very complex situation, but you got to help somehow. You got to help somehow. And I'm, I've been led to believe over the last week or two that it's a far more prevalent problem than I ever thought. And so I figured we would talk about it here. 
as adults, just have conversations, ask questions, be inquisitive about stuff like that because the the fruits, I'm not even going to call them fruits because that sort of entails that they're positive. I mean, the long-term detriment of a child going through something like that, it's worth asking a few questions if you can stop it from happening. And so it was common enough when I was a kid, that's just one story. I can name off the top of my head three or four people by name to this day that I remember in high school were being abused either physically or sexually in high school. And like, it just, they had to, they had to sort it out themselves because people were just like, oh, that's their family's business or I don't have solid proof or, you know, whatever it is. And it's obviously, this is most of the stuff I found out after I turned 18. But for example, the individual I talked about today, what was going on became fairly obvious to a lot of the other kids in the class and, or at least in our grade. And it was still weird how no teachers, nobody caught on and nobody tried to fix it. And so I, I, I declare that that's utterly unacceptable. And were I in that position again, I think that I would have been a little bit more ballsy in talking to somebody and trying to make sure that, you know, something happened that would help with it. And I would urge you to do the same thing. And so that's the topic for today, oh, child, child abuse. It's, it's, it's quite frankly more frequent than I would ever like to admit in my emails that I hear about things like that. And so my heart goes out to anybody right now in my viewership that something like that is happening to child or adult. If you're being abused by anybody else around you, strongly consider getting yourself some help. I mean, I just got a, that wasn't me like crying. It was a frog in my throat. Anyways, I would strongly consider, you know, going to the police, going to a social worker, get yourself help. Don't stay in a situation like that. Um, if nobody else has your back, I know I don't know you specifically, but you know, I've got your back. So there it is right there. I mean, that's, I hope that you will, you know, work on your situation or at least that somebody, if you're not in a position to help yourself, that somebody else will help you because you deserve it. Uh, you're a nice person and nobody deserves to be abused like that. So that's our topic for the day. I realized that was kind of like a dark topic, but I wanted to talk about it briefly. I really, really did. I felt like it was something that needed to be touched on and something that needed to be just discussed briefly. So let's do a Q&A real fast. We're not going to talk about the games this week because honestly, I don't really have a lot of like interesting observations. But at the moment, we got a couple of questions that I wanted to hit this week. The first question is, as a point of discussion, what are your views on DLC versus old school expansion packs? So for example, if DLC was wrapped up into one to three extensions, do you think it would have the same negative connotation that it does now? Whereas back in the day, you would have to buy expansion packs. In addition, if you disagree with DLC, would the return of said expansion packs be good? I grew up definitely during the period where expansion packs were like a normal thing. There was no such thing as digital distribution. Honestly, cartridges were like half of my life. And then like the other half was PlayStation. And then finally, when I was 14 or 15, I started to get into PC gaming. And honestly, even digital distribution, then I usually bought boxed copies of like everything. And so yeah, expansions were like the way things went. I think that DLC can be done right, and I think that DLC can be done wrong. DLC done wrong would be, for example, things like I saw in Dragon Age, which was one of that was one of the first games that DLC caught my notice. Dragon Age was one of those games where the day you I got the game the morning it came out. Like seriously, I waited at the front door of Best Buy to go buy this game. I got home. I booted it up. The second I had it installed, it already had DLC in the market. And it was not like normal DLC where it's just like, or I'm sorry, acceptable DLC, which is like cosmetic stuff. It was like actual full quest chains that added stuff onto the game and made your characters have at least like better loot or at least a better selection of loot for the challenges that would come as you went through the game. And as I recall, there were two or three of those. And I remember sitting there and just kind of like scratching my head and being like, that is bullshit. That is infuriating right there. Like, I don't have to buy it, but at the same time, I'm definitely missing out on something if I don't. And if you have it right here in the DLC store, the day the game came out, why couldn't you have just packed it onto the gold disc, which I'm willing to bet was cut like three weeks ago before the distribution. You know what I mean? So I think that's DLC done wrong. If you're withholding content, or at the bare minimum, if the content is available on the market the day the game came out and it adds areas to the game and stuff like that, it should have just been packaged with the game in the first place. Obviously, you had it pre-release if it's all ready to go. You had to like upload that to a server and get it ready for distribution long before release, which means that it was long enough before release where it probably could have gone onto the gold disc because the gold copies, if you don't know what a gold copy of the game is, the gold disc is the master disc. It's the final copy that will be distributed through stores. 
it's the copy from which all other copies will be made essentially and so if you were able to set that up on your server infrastructure weeks in advance most of the time gold discs are cut like a month before the game goes into distribution and so i'm willing to bet you could have just like tacked it onto the game real fast you know like stuff like that annoys me dlc that's in like a gray area is like saints row where you don't necessarily need it it's all like cosmetic stuff and it makes for nice flavor things on Steam sales and stuff like that you can throw in for free. That's kind of like a gray area because, like, honestly, with Saints Row, they bounce back and forth between stuff you want and stuff that's just sort of, like, cosmetic. But the stuff, I, I honestly, I prefer DLC packs that are actually, like, fully fledged out. Like, I don't mind dropping two ninety nine on a DLC pack if it adds, for example, like, I'll add for, I liked with Kingdoms of Amalur. I didn't hate the DLCs for that. I felt like they were their own self-contained little quest lines. It had like two, three hours of gameplay for like two, three dollars. That didn't seem too bad to me. Was it that cheap? I should probably Google that right now before I disseminate false information. Give me a second here. I mean, what was the price on Amalur DLC? Let's find out. So, the Amalur DLC was the Legend of Dead Kel. We can look at it right now. It was $9.99. And I did Dead Kel, and I did a couple of the other ones as well. The Teeth of Naros or something like that. Yeah, I did both of those, and I didn't feel cheated. They were like $9.99. They added like three, four, five hours of gameplay. They added a whole bunch of new item sets and like cool stuff. It was fully voiced over, so the new quest lines were completely acted and everything. They all had their own side quests. They opened up a new area of the map that did not exist prior to release. I didn't mind that. All of the other drama around Kingdoms of Amalur aside... That DLC was done okay, and I didn't feel cheated. The gray area would be like Saints Row, where some of it's good, some of it's not, and it's kind of your responsibility to filter through and figure out what's worth it to you and what isn't. And the utterly unacceptable is like Dragon Age, where they had content that could have been put on the gold disc, and they didn't include it. Honestly, I prefer expansions. I would rather developers just stay away from DLC, just make like a big lump of it that's all thematic, and then throw it into an expansion pack, but I can't tell how much of that for me is like nostalgia and the desire for the past to be real because as you get older it's a weird thing like you know how old people tend to be really grumpy about stuff that used to exist i've noticed that that started to creep into my brain where i just have like this weird irrational desire for things to be the way that they used to be and i'm trying to fight it a little bit or at least rationalize the decision before i make those assertions but yeah i i really sincerely dlc is not a thing that i'm a fan of and typically i don't shell out for it unless it's really really worth it if with some indie games, it's been worth it. I'm having trouble thinking of examples right now, but I know sometimes there will be DLCs for games that I have no problem paying for because it's been like six months since the game came out. This adds like another 10 hours of gameplay. It's $6.99, so yeah, throw it onto my game real fast because I like to have a complete experience, especially if I'm coming back for a second playthrough. I'll buy DLC if it adds significant areas to the game just so that my second playthrough will at least have something fresh that I can check out the next time through. But I think I still prefer expansion packs, even though I think the day of the expansion pack is probably falling by the wayside. I would, my guess would be it's probably going somewhere else. Does everything need to be an MMO? I've seen some games work well and badly as MMO, MMOs, and others get certain pieces right and wrong. Why have developers decided to make a game an MMO, and did it enhance the game? Yeah, I think along those lines that there is a big multiplayer push, and I think the first time that I ever saw there be like a backlash about a game not being multiplayer was Wolfenstein. Uh, the new Wolfenstein came out, and it was a great single-player experience. The game had a reasonable duration. You couldn't beat it in one sitting. The game was actually, it surprised me how long the new Wolfenstein was. The gameplay was tight. The sound effects, the voice acting, the storyline, great. But I was really, really surprised to find how many people knocked it down a peg or took stars off of their review because it didn't have multiplayer. Why does multiplayer have to be a requirement for a game nowadays? What's wrong with creating a satisfying single-player experience? As long as it's noted on the box that there is no multiplayer here, no one should be lowering a review based on the fact that a game did not include multiplayer. That would be like knocking a game back because it didn't include crafting. Well, if the crafting didn't fit logically inside the confines of the game, why would you add crafting? It sounds like it would be a detractor, or it would just be something tacked on that felt kind of just like it was there just to fit in with the trend of adding crafting. I feel the same way about multiplayer. If you've got a solid experience in your single-player game, and that's what you had the finances to get done, and you aren't confident that you can make a good multiplayer experience, why bother in the first place? Save the assets, save the money, count it off as profit, and just make the single-player game, of course, unless you promised a multiplayer aspect to the game in the first place as a developer. But I think Wolfenstein is the example I'd use right there, and absolutely not. 
I am a firm believer. I'm a single player gamer. Occasionally I'll jump around like with Halo or something like that and I'll play multiplayer. And when I buy like Call of Duty, for example, or when I buy Halo, it's specifically because of the multiplayer. I very rarely play the single player in either game. But there's nothing wrong with making a good single player experience and then just calling it a day and putting a bow on it. And I don't understand why people are so feel like they're so entitled to a multiplayer experience on every single game. If it doesn't fit, don't add it. I mean, don't fix what ain't broken. In my in my opinion, if you can make good multiplayer, well, add the good multiplayer. But if it doesn't fit within the confines of the mechanics you've already designed, then eh, don't worry about it. We got a bunch of good questions this week, actually. This one was really, really, really hard to decide here. I'm going to do this. Let's see. I don't normally do game requests, but would you do a Vigante LP? Yes, I will more than likely do a Vigante LP as it approaches its 1.0. O version as it gets toward there it'll more than likely happen a lot of interesting stuff what was your favorite lp series it looks like somebody deleted this right here or maybe i don't know it looks like the chat chain got broken but what was my favorite lp shadow run returns by far uh, shadow run returns was a game that i just bumped my desk sorry unprofessional shadow run returns was a game that was the first return of an ip that i hadn't seen in 10 to 15 years i've always been a huge shadow run fan since i was a kid i found out that shadow run was an alternative to DD, and i've loved the setting i've loved kind of like the pantheon of who's who i've loved the corporations of renraku and Ares and mitsuhama and all these people like competing against each other to see who can dig their way to the bottom of the barrel fastest for the most shady business practices and assassination nations i've loved the setting since i was a kid there's been warhammer 40k and there's been shadow run those are the two universes that like i love them i love everything about them and while both have gone through their ups and downs i've never fallen away from either like i i still to this day i'm just like a huge fanboy of both and i had such a good time running through shadow run returns like seriously shadow run is an ip that really deserves good games and over the last 20 years has just had bad game after bad game after bad game after misrepresentation and it's it's so good to finally see harebrained schemes coming back through and like redeeming the shadow run name because seriously the shadow run books are good the role-playing books very good the tabletop game fantastic and so it always seems so mind-bending to me that there are so many bad games surrounding shadow run and so many bad just things surrounding the IP and so I'm so glad with I mean part of the thing is that the actual creator of Shadowrun is in charge of everything that goes on at Harebrain Schemes and so now you've got just like a back to basics no nonsense approach to creating true to form Shadowrun content and I love that I mean Shadowrun Returns I think was probably my favorite LP that I've ever run Shadowrun Dragonfall I had some foibles with the game I didn't like the nerfed hit rates I felt like if you focus specifically on a weapon you should hit 95% of the time with it if you put 10 points into something instead of putting it into other stuff you should be rewarded for that. And so I didn't like the nerfed hit rates, but I still loved both games. I mean, I had my... Dragonfall had things I loved, and Dragonfall had a few changes that I didn't like. It just sort of depended. I liked how Shaman were actually viable in Shadowrun Dragonfall. I mean, they were they were decent buff characters. So anyways, I love Shadowrun Returns, though. Such a good game. It was good to get back into Seattle and see, you know, the Halloweeners and the i5ers and all of those random gangs that I grew up playing against in the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo games. Very, very exciting stuff, and it's my favorite LP that I have ever done on the channel. As a bonus to that question, my surprise series, the series that I enjoyed far more than I ever expected to was Craft the World. Craft the World was one of those random games that I liked the game and I started playing it, but once we got that LP going, for whatever reason, it was just like really, really fun and like really, really just a good game all around. Even though the presentation makes it look like it's a random iPhone game, it's actually a good game once you play it for a while. It's one of those games that is actually like sort of hampered by its graphical representation. A lot of people think it looks cheap and so they don't buy it, but it's actually a really, really good game. Let's see here. Splattercat, can you do a word of the day since your vocabulary is extensive? Done. It'll start next week in our weekend reviews. Is my hair messed up right now? I just realized I went to the mall today and I had a beanie on all day and I didn't think about it. Maybe I should have like taken a brush to my head before I started this thing off. The name of the well-known... Oh, there we go. So I said the last time people wanted me to talk about board games, the Czech game designer so for, of Prophecy, my favorite board game ever, his name is Vladimir... Ooh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher this. Vatil? It's got a C-H-V-A-T-I-L. So I'm gonna assume that it's Vladimir Vatil and that the C-H... 
or maybe it makes a Z sound. Wasn't that what it was? Like Svata? Wasn't it Svatil? Maybe it was. I don't know. You might not know this, but my check is very, very, it's very weak. It's very, very weak. Anyways, I think that just about covers it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the subject that we talk about. Seriously, think about the things that I discussed in the front end of this video. If you know somebody that's being harmed in a way that is just utterly unacceptable, just do something for them, whatever you can, whether it's just being an ear to talk to, that's something that can help somebody get through a hard time. If you can do something else like making the authorities aware or helping this person through social structures that exist within your country of origin, then do that as well. But just do whatever you can for this person. Do whatever you can, because frankly, that's a hard position to be in. I've never been there, so I can't talk about it. But from some of these emails I get, I, I think that was right about the point. I knew I had to talk about it. I had tears in my eyes the other night. Tears in my eyes. And that's not easy to do. Like, I'm a very stoic person. It's just my family. We're not emotional people. And still, when I was reading that email, I was just like, oh, my God, someone needs to help this child. And I felt so helpless because they're so far away. They're not from the United States. There's, I don't know what to do for them. And so, please, please be kind to one another. Help each other out. That's the at the end of the day, the golden rule. Like, if you know somebody is going through something, help them out. Be kind. Do whatever you can for that individual. Don't let them suffer in silence because it will affect them negatively in the future. They're, they're earning scars that they have to think about for the rest of their life. And if you can save them a couple of those, I think it's the ethically responsible thing to do. So anyways, it's I figured I, I can't do anything physically for these people, but I can make a video about it. And maybe somebody who can do something for one of these people can help them. So anyways, my name is Splattercat. Thank you for joining me here in this weekend review. I will see you all later. Feel free to leave me ideas for what you want to talk about in the comments down below. Serious topics. I've decided I'm going to stay away from politics and religion. I can touch on things of philosophy if people would like. So the philosophy of religion and things of that nature, if people want to talk about that, in the stipulation that I'd like the comments to remain friendly, if it turns into one of those things where I've got nerd castle people at each other's throats over the conversational topic, I would rather have everybody remain friends. Just kind of like my old man used to say, if you want to keep your friends, never talk about religion and politics. That's it. Never rap. Religion and politics. You stay away from that, you'll have friends your entire life. Anyways, I'll see you all next week. I do, everybody.